Come on in, everyone. Hey, Mr. Younger. Yes. So uh, this is Logan. Um, I was wondering if don't isn't the midterm next Monday? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that that'll be. Yeah, next Monday. I'm just trying to remember because the the switchover day is Tuesday. So yeah, all my Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays were pushed to next week, so they'll be on the same week as your exam, which is on Monday. Okay, would I be able to do what I did last time for the face to face test and take it from home with the webcam browser? Thing. Yeah, I think I can do that. Uh, can you send me a, a text message like Thursday or Friday just to remind me? That would be very helpful. Yeah, is your number in the syllabus? Yes, and okay. I'll put it here too just in case. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Logan. So yeah, this is my cell phone number. You should text me first if you ever need to get up with me. Just because I don't answer numbers, I don't know. And if you, if I don't know you're coming, then I, I won't answer it. So anyways, yeah, text me that. That'd be great. Appreciate it. And I will help you. Uh, I did make the final and uh, sent it there. But for some, I mean, a, a practice second midterm. And I sent it to the class and it's supposed to be there, but it's not. Hopefully it'll come in the next few minutes because I just recopied it. I don't know where the heck it went. But anyways, uh, I don't see it here. I don't see it anywhere in my quizzes, but it will be called practice underscore second midterm chapters one through eight. So as you might suspect, that means you're. Uh, mid your next face to face test will be covering chapters one through eight. And yes, I don't see it anywhere. So weird. I keep I send these tests and then they like just everything seems to go okay, but they just disappear. And I do not see it now. Anybody have any other questions before we get started? That's not good. <laughs> I've got a chapter, or excuse me, a practice test seven that's actually on an entirely different subject, and it won't let me hide it because someone's already taken it, which is really bad because it's a totally un unrelated subject. I don't know how it got here in the first place. Oh, good Lord. Mm. Yep, uh, still don't see it. Practice test, practice test. Oh, well. So when we last talked, we had started into, actually, let me double check my notes just to make sure, because I think we were on the same place uh, as my face-to-face -face class. So my last one would have been 241 on 1018. Let's double check. Ah, yes, we had done the same thing. So we were into conservation of momentum, and I even talked a little bit about Bernoulli's principle and how you could use that to get top spin and curveballs and sliders and all that good stuff. But uh, now we're going into chapter uh, nine again, which is cons uh, which is conservation of momentum, or more specifically, momentum in general. So, does anybody have any questions about the stuff we covered last time before we get cracking? All right, so let me go ahead and I'm going to do the share of my screen and we're going to work a couple problems and show you how to do some of these conservation of momentum problems. Typically today we're going to get through uh, one dimensional slash head on collisions. So hopefully that should uh, give you a nice little uh, transition into the two dimensional and three dimensional collisions which are a little, uh, quite a bit more complicated. And of course, you always got to remember the fundamental rule of algebra, which basically is that uh, for each unknown you have, you've got to have one equation. So if you have three unknowns, that means you th need three equations. If you got uh, 12 unknowns, you got to have 12 equations, so on and so forth. So just make sure you keep that in mind. Uh, in the case of conservation of momentum in one dimension, it's pretty much just uh, V and A, or excuse me, M and V, and then M and V after the collisions, they're all in one dimension. So that literally gives you one equation. If you're lucky enough to have elastic collisions, then you get a second equation. So you can find two unknowns. So that's what we're going to work on today. 
Uh, then with that one, we'll finish uh, several uh, single dimensional problems plus a problem where we're going to calculate the muzzle velocity for, say, a, a rifle. And then next time we'll do some center of mass calculations as well as uh, some more conservation of momentum stuff. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, again, one more time, anybody have any questions before I get cracking? Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is recoil. So if you've ever fired a gun, uh, then you know about recoil. If you've ever tried to stand on the ice or on roller skates or on a skateboard or on ice skates and tried to throw anything, then you know a little bit about recoil as well. So if you imagine, I'm doing an example not unlike the book, if you imagine, for instance, uh, a rifle like such, And initially it's sitting still and inside of it is a shell that's also sitting still and a bullet that's in the shell. And of course, once, once you pull the trigger that hits a little, uh, a little metal part in the back of the shell that causes enough pressure to cause an explosion. That explosion uh, puts a great deal of stress on the inside of the shell, but the inside of the shell is surrounded by a metal barrel. Uh, so it's able to hold it in and the back end is held by some metal as well and that's able to hold that in. So ultimately, the only choice for the projectile is to take off out the front of the barrel. So the momentum initially, PI, is in fact equal to zero. And the little bullet inside, we can say, has a mass of 0 0.0115 kilograms. Okay. And we're going to say, ultimately, what's going to happen is the bullet will fire. And the bullet will fly out, let's say, with a velocity V, which I'm going to say is 655 meters per second and this thing's going to have a recoil velocity and this by the way this rifle has a mass m is equal to 4.7 kilograms and it's going to have a velocity of v recoil and that's what we want to know so in this case, it's it's sort of important when you start talking about ang angular momentum, uh, linear momentum in this case, and stuff like that. You need to think not only about, uh, you know, F equals MA and stuff like that, but more specifically, you've actually got to put a little thought into exactly what the system is that you're using Newton's second law for. So in this uh, situation, we're saying the system is the bullet plus the shell plus the black powder plus the rifle and you can imagine in this scenario that it's as if the rifle was uh mounted on a table say with uh wheels on it so that it can roll freely uh any direction it wants and it has an electronic controlled trigger so you, no one has to be anywhere near it you just push the button and the electronic signal is going to fire the uh squeeze the trigger and squeezing the trigger is going to fire and the bullet's going to take off in one direction and the rifle is going to recoil in another direction. And we're going to figure out what that velocity is. So after the collision, P final is going to be little m times, uh, well, let's just go ahead and put the numbers. I'm going to say 0 0.015 kilograms times 655 meters per second, which is a pretty good uh, muzzle velocity. That's, you know, on the order of uh, about two Mach, so it's about twice as fast as the speed of sound. And then we're also going to have the rifle mass, which is 4.7 kilograms, and that's going to be multiplied by the recoil velocity. 
And the forces acting on the system would obviously be the, the little wheels that are attached to the, uh, to the actual rifle. Those wheels are going to have to put a normal force from each one on the actual rifle to keep gravity from pulling it down through the table. And then, of course, gravity is going to be pulling down on it. Those two forces are going to cancel out. Uh, there will be a minimal amount of air resistance on both the shell and, or excuse me, the, the projectile and the rifle. But we're really just trying to figure out the speed, the instant it comes out the barrel. So you, that's really insignificant. So the net force on this is zero. So the summation forces is approximately zero. And that means P is a constant and that's the definition or that's the condition that's necessary for conservation of momentum the net force acting on the system must be zero or approximately zero and then you can sort of estimate it to be that so with this case we're going to have zero is equal to now i'm going to go ahead and multiply 0 0.015 or excuse me 0 0.015 times 655 that gives me 9.825, and that's kilograms, meters per second. I had two sig figs in both of those answers, so I'm going to underscore the last two digits so you can see that they're not significant. And then I'm going to have plus 4.7 kilograms times V recoil, and that's conservation of momentum. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for V recoil. And what we get is V recoil is 9.825 kilograms meters per second over 4.7 kilograms. And that gives me 2.09. I'll call that 2.09090. And that's meters per second. And technically, when I pulled it over here, that's going to make that negative. So that'll make that negative as well. So obviously, when I call it V uh, for the bullet, which seems to be going right as positive 655 meters per second, that forced V recoil to be negative 2.1 meters per second. So the actual rifle will be rolling to the left with a recoil, and this is the word I'm saying in case it, whoa, Nelly. And this is the word I'm saying in case anybody uh, doesn't recognize the word. V recoil is negative 2.1 meters per second. And if I remember correctly, it's roughly about 2.3 times the meters per second gives you miles per hour. So we're talking on the order of uh, four or five miles per hour is how fast the rifle will be going back. So if you actually are holding this rifle and you're holding it where it's off of your shoulder instead of actually bumped against it, then yeah, uh, your arms can hold it a little bit from going forward or backwards. And, and if you really know what you're doing and, and are strong enough, you can probably keep it from moving at all. But the main thing is if you're not ready for it or whatever, that bullet or that rifle will fire back towards you at around five miles per hour, and it weighs about five, uh, about 10 pounds. So uh, that could be a little bit painful. It's usually just a small bruise or something like that, but it's real. Uh, so that's really what happens. And that's why, you know, shooting a shotgun or something like that sometimes hurts people's shoulders. But I also want to point out that uh, largely what we see in the movies is completely fake. So how many times have you seen Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, fire a gun and then it hits a, another person and that person gets knocked off their feet and maybe even through a wall. Uh, the way conservation of momentum works, if a person, let's say Clint Eastwood or Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone, uh, if they are actually holding a gun and then they fire it, what's going to happen is that bullet's going to leave with a mass times velocity. And that mass of the bullet, you know, it can be anywhere from, you know, 0 0.010 kilograms to, you know, maybe a little bit heavier. Uh, if you really want to pack something, it could be, you know, maybe even a whole 
uh, 0 0.05 or 0 0.07 kilograms. And it's going to move on the order of 300 to, you know, 300 to 700 meters per second. And that momentum is the momentum that the bullet has. And because the initial momentum of the system was zero, because the rifle and the person and the bullet were all sitting still, when you fire it, what's going to happen is the bullet's going to leave with that momentum and the rifle person system is going to move in the opposite direction with the same momentum, only that mass is really big. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone or Clint Eastwood uh, are all going to weigh on the order of 100 kilograms. So they're not going to move very fast. But keep that in mind, okay? So now this bullet goes off with the exact same momentum that uh, those actors have. And it then... Uh, best case, quote unquote, best case scenario for the movie in order for the person that gets shot to be slammed through a wall or something like that is the bullet hits the person and embeds in them so that the entire momentum of the bullet is in, uh, is transferred to the person. Well, if that momentum, which was transferred from the bullet to this person, uh, because of conservation of momentum, that momentum was also transferred to the person shooting the gun. And if the person shooting the gun was roughly the same size as the person getting shot by the gun, then the exact same effect should happen. So if it's really, really a big enough, fast enough bullet to hit someone and then knock them through a wall, then uh, unless the person shooting the gun is two to 10 times bigger than the person getting shot by the gun, then the same thing's going to happen to them. And the short story is it doesn't happen to them because the bullets just don't have that much momentum. And, if, and that, in other words, if you really wanted to try to do something like that, you'd have to shoot something very, very lightweight and you're not even going to get that kind of response, you know, from something that's two pounds. So that's a big, uh, a big selling point on, in terms of movies as uh the miseducating us and it is a little there is some danger to it i once saw a study some time ago how uh about the show uh er where people were worried about it because in er they showed a lot of people surviving after getting cpr and stuff like that and the stats are way 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 lower uh for people surviving after e after ek or excuse me after having a heart attack and then getting uh you know, chest compressions and all that good stuff. So they were really concerned that people might make decisions based on uh, seeing those episodes and thinking that you could really save them a lot more frequently than you can. Well, the same thing happens here. One thing, when you see a, a movie go off in a movie, it's almost always very, very loud and thunderous and stuff like that. If you actually seen ever, ever seen any footage or real life events where someone fired a gun, uh, you'll notice that it's just sort of a cock, 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 or a pop, 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 something like that. It's really, really insignificant. And that leads you to maybe uh, undervalue or be under-concerned about pop, pop, pops that you hear in, you know, when you're out shopping or something like that. So that's that's also a little bit of a danger. And two, if you see people that aren't falling and going through walls and stuff, then you're further thinking that they're not being shot. Uh, I do know uh, some time ago there was a horrible story where a, a disgruntled former news employee uh, shot a, a lady uh, in northern Virginia area and he was shooting her like with a 45 caliber Glock and she was a petite you know young lady and she just she got shot like four or five times on camera on Facebook and she didn't fall uh, so you know people that see that might think well, well he's just chasing her but you know, they heard the cracks or the pops, but they didn't think gun because the person didn't fall. So that's just something to keep in mind. So anyways, from that standpoint, I think you're now seeing that, yes, it's very unlikely for a, a bullet to actually cause a person to blow through a wall or something like that. Uh, if you maybe shot a person with a 15 inch uh, shell that came out of an aircraft uh, or excuse me out of a ship like a destroyer or something like that yeah that would totally do it but again uh in that case when those things fire the whole ship leans so anyways that's one example anybody have any questions on that recoil example and i know these topics are somewhat macabre but uh, i try to bring a little bit of reality into it and you know being a p-town person i've experienced a little bit of this and seen gunshots and things but anyways any questions on that all right, 
So that's a typical problem that you can do with conservation of momentum. Another problem you can do with a couple of things is really uh, determining muzzle velocity. So let's write this, we'll say, determine muzzle velocity. So one way you can do this is with a ballistic pendulum, and that's what I'm gonna do here. Okay, so what we're gonna imagine is there's already a bullet on the way. Okay, it's just this little ball here and it has a mass of little m. And it's getting ready to embed into a really, really big mass, call it big m, that's sitting perfectly still. And big m, in fact, is hanging from a ceiling in such a way that it actually has some ability to move. Uh, this is going to have a velocity, big V, and big V equals muzzle velocity. And that's the thing that equals question mark. We assume, oops, Assume we know M, big M, and H, which you'll see come up in a second, okay? And what we're wanting to do is find the muzzle velocity. So this is one shot, and I'm going to say right here, we're going to do conservation of momentum. And then what's going to happen, and that's for this part as well as this part, what's going to happen is you'll see that this big block of wood or whatever now has a mass of m plus little m. And that's because the little bullet is now lodged inside and it's moving with a velocity I'm going to call V1. Okay. Again, this is still hanging from the ceiling. So then we're going to use conservation of energy. And that's going to allow us to determine, given the height, it's going to allow us to determine exactly what uh, the initial muzzle velocity was. So in this case, what we now see is uh, this, oops, the block that we had is going to be right here. The ropes to the ceiling are going to be here and here. And this height from the height that it was originally at is H. And it's come to a stop and its mass is M plus M because, again, it still has the bullet inside like that. Okay. Ooh, actually, that makes, let me fix that a little bit. That's kind of ugly. So this is mass M plus M and the height H, of course, is above where it was before, which we'll draw sort of like this. Okay. So now we're in a position to do it. Uh, what we have initially is, as I said, we're going to use conservation of momentum. So we have M times V is equal to, because initially that's the only thing that's moving, but then that's going to be equal to M plus big M times V1, okay? And then that tells us that V1 is equal to M, 
over M plus M times the muzzle velocity. Now we're going to use conservation of energy, which says that one half of M plus M times V1 squared is going to be equal to M plus M times G times H. And of course, we can see that the M plus M cancels out. And we can also plug this V1 into there. So I'm now going to get M over M plus M V squared over that squared is equal to 2GH. So we can now finally say that V, the muzzle velocity in terms of M, M, G, and H, which are all things we know, will be the square root of 2 times G times H times M plus M over M. Okay, notice when I pull it over there, it'll be M plus M on top and little M on bottom. And then when you take the square root of both sides, the M plus M squared over M squared is going to cancel out, and that leaves our final velocity. Anybody have any questions on that? So that's one of the many ways you can you determine just muzzle velocity of a rifle, projectile, or anything like that. Of course, you guys had your projectile motion lab, too. So you've seen another way you can do it is just fire it horizontally and see how far it lands, measure how high it is above the ground. Uh, use the acceleration of gravity to figure out with it that, that high above the ground, how long it takes to reach the ground. Then you divide the distance away from where it left the barrel of the projectile device, uh, how far away to the left it went or to the right it went in that uh, time and you divide that distance by the time, and that gives you the horizontal velocity. And if you fired it horizontally, then that's the total velocity. So that's another way you can do it as well. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, so let's go to another example. And in this case, we're going to talk about uh, 1D, our head-on collisions. that are elastic. Does anybody recall what elastic collisions meant? It was something I said, but I didn't really do any examples with it. Uh, I just told you that's what it was. Anybody recall? Is it that the energy is completely transferred? Uh, sort of. It's that the kinetic energy is conserved. So I'll show you that in form of a one-dimensional collision here, and it'll, it'll make perfect sense when you do it. But yeah, so you're you're on the right track. Uh, and in fact, there's something called a perfectly inelastic collision, and a perfectly and in a perfectly inelastic collision, two things collide and then stick together so that they leave uh, the collision with the same velocity. It turns out if you do that in what's called a center of mass frame instead of the lab frame, then the entire kinetic energy will be lost because after the collision, the two things are not moving with respect to each other. So they're not moving with respect to the center of mass. Therefore, it's like they literally lost all their kinetic energy. So that's why they call it a completely inelastic collision. So what we can do right now is I can say... M sub A, so what we're picturing here is here's a part particle A. It has a mass M A, and it has a velocity V A. And then here's a particle B, has a mass M B, and a velocity V B. And I'm not putting the signs on the velocities or anything like that. I'm just calling them V A and V B. And if they turn out to be negative, that means they're going in the, uh, let's say, left direction, and so on and so forth. 
And then after the collision, what's going to happen is uh, MA will now be moving, say, with a velocity VA prime, and that's A right there, and MB will be moving with a velocity VB prime. So conservation of momentum tells me that MAVA plus MBVB is equal to MAVA prime plus MBVB prime. Now, remember, momentum is a, a, a vector quantity. So technically speaking, you would have to be dealing with vectors. But because this is one dimensional, uh, the sign of the number gives you direction and the magnitude is the magnitude. So we've got all the bases covered with just this equation. And I'll call it equation one. And this, as I said, is conservation of momentum. Now, if you actually had this in two dimensions, then you'd say MAVA sub X plus MBVB sub X equals MAVA prime sub X plus MBVB prime sub X. And then you have the exact same thing with the subscript Y for the Y component. If it's three dimensions, you'd have another third equation for the Z. Uh, but in this case, it's one dimensional, so that's all we have. Now I'm going to use the elastic part. And for that, we know that we have one half M sub A V sub A squared, because that's what kinetic energy is, plus one half M sub B V sub B squared is equal to one half M sub A V sub A prime squared plus one half M sub B VB prime squared. Okay. Now you can immediately see that in this equation, the one half is in every term. So you can multiply three by two and get rid of that. And that comes kind of hand comes in kind of handy. Uh, this is going to be equation two. Now I'm going to reorient equation one. So uh, playing. with oops, one, we can get MA times VA minus VA prime is equal to MB times VB prime minus VB. And I'll call that equation one prime. Now, Playing with two, I'm going to get M A times V A squared minus V A prime squared is equal to M B times V B prime squared minus V B squared. Okay. And I can write that further still as M A V A minus V A prime times V A plus V A prime is equal to M B V B prime minus V B times V B prime plus V B. Does everybody recognize the factoring trick that I just did. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so this is a technique that you learn when you take physics, and then you can also uh, use it, of course, to get good results in other scenarios, uh, you can use the idea of it to try to solve other physics problems and stuff like that. But more specifically, you can always use it in case you forget these equations too. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to divide two prime by one prime. 
And I think you can see what happens there because clearly uh, two prime has a MA, a VA minus VA prime. So that's going to actually cancel out. Uh, and we'll do it like this. So I'm going to say MA, VA minus VA prime, VA plus VA prime is equal to MB, VB prime minus VB times VB prime plus VB. And then I'm dividing that by MA, VA minus VA prime equals MB times VB prime minus VB. So notice this is just one prime and this is just two prime. And when we divide them, you can see that basically this MA cancels out with this MA. This VA minus VA prime cancels out with this VA minus VA prime. And then similarly, this MB cancels out with this MB. And this VB prime minus VB cancels out with this VB prime minus VB. So all I'm left with is just VA plus VA prime is equal to VB prime plus VB. Now, if we put this equation in terms of uh, the befores and afters, then what we can get is VA minus VB is equal to VB prime minus VA prime. And that's the equation we're shooting for. But you can also write it in this other form if you like. You can say uh, VA minus VB is equal to negative of VA prime minus VB prime. So this is the new result that we have. And in fact, this equation is uh, numbered in your book. I think it's qu called equation 9-8 maybe. And the fact that it's numbered means that you can put it in your equation sheet. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. So now let's show you how to use this. So imagine two, I'll put identical. pool balls or billiards balls in case you're getting confused with a swimming pool. Uh, so imagine two identical pool balls. What I mean by identical is clearly, you know, one could be a cue ball and the other one could be a nine ball, but the main thing is they weigh the same. <laughs> okay. So uh, imagine two identical pool balls with one moving toward the other that is oops sitting still find the final velocities Assuming the collision is elastic. And it sort of goes without saying that you're going to assume momentum is conserved uh, in this case, mainly because the air resistance would be negligible, the friction would be negligible. Uh, so the, the forces, other than the internal forces, where one ball is putting a force on another, for instance, those forces are definitely going to be very, very small, if not zero. So I'm going to go ahead and write this out, because one of them sitting still, we're going to have the following. Conservation of momentum. Okay. 
what we're going to have is M A V A. That's all. Okay. Cause the mass B is not moving. This is going to be M A. Oh, actually I shouldn't even say that. Uh, Let's take this away. And we're going to make use of the fact that identical implies MA equals MB is just equal to plain M. So now conservation of momentum gives us M times VA is equal to M times VA prime plus M times VB prime. And you can see that the M's cancel out like that. Right? Now we're going to make use of the equation we just had. So That equation is VA, oops, that equation, I'm going to call this one one, by the way, and this equation we'll call two, is VA minus VB is equal to, uh, if we look back at it, VA minus VB, you ended up getting a different order, so VB prime minus VA prime, like this, but in this case, V B prime was zero. So we get, in fact, VA is equal to VB prime minus VA prime. All right. So again, this is also equation two. So I am going to say, by the way, that this also is equation one. VA is equal to VA prime plus VB prime. So this comes in really handy. This is equation one. So I'm going to add one and two. So when I do that, I get two VA is equal to VA plus negative VA. VA prime plus negative VA prime is zero, but I get two VB prime. And that means that VB prime, which is what we're trying to look for, is actually equal to VA. So that's one of our results. Now we can use this to plug back into, say, equation two or equation one. Let's call this three. Plug three into uh, two. And you could plug it into one. Either one doesn't really matter. But in this case, I'm going to get uh, VA. Oops. I'm going to get VA is equal to VA, because notice it was VA equals VB prime minus VA, and we just found that VB prime was VA minus VA prime. And this tells you that, in fact, uh, negative VA prime is equal to zero. So what just happened was... You could imagine a scenario like this. This could be the cue ball moving with a velocity of 2.0 meters per second running into the two ball. I think two ball is, and that'd be like a 12 or something like that. I'll make it completely red. There you go. Then I'll be a two ball. And this is running into the two ball that's sitting still. And then after the collision, the cue ball is now sitting still. And that's VA prime equals zero. But now we have this red ball. moving with a velocity of 2.0 meters per second. 
So, oops, let me actually make that a little cleaner. It's hard to tell with that decimal. That's 2.0 meters per second. So this is sort of like Newton's cradle. Which basically, if you've seen it before, it's basically like a wire rack like this. And then over here, you've got a similar wire rack. And what you have is a series of balls. Five balls in actuality. And they're attached by a string. Like this. Okay, and what you do is if you pick up one ball and then drop it, it's going to come out and then a single ball will come out and reach the same height. So if you just imagine this as being exactly two balls, then you'd see this is exactly the same. It's like the cue ball. Actually, let me change that. So this is like the cue ball. And this is like the two ball. So the cue ball comes in, hits the two ball, and then the two ball leaves essentially with the same velocity so that it goes up just as high. In fact, if you do two of them, two of them will pop out. If you do three of them, then three of them will pop out, which is really neat because uh, three of them requires the one in the middle to go up with the left and then continuing going up with the right. So that's sort of what Newton's cradle uh, is pretty cool at demonstrating. But anyways, anybody have any questions on that? All right, so you can see that they basically are just trading velocities. And in fact, even if you look at this, what they're trading with this equation 9-8 is they're, they're essentially trading because you could say, for instance, let's say, uh, let's say this is four meters per second and that's minus uh, six meters per second. And in, in that case, one's four and one's six. Actually, let's make it negative six. So they're actually coming towards each other. Uh, and then that means you get 10 meters per second for this side. Now, what we're saying here is after the fact, you could get six meters per second going in the positive direction minus negative four meters per second and that would in fact give you now a uh, positive six uh, ten meters per second but we actually need it in a different order so excuse me let me change that so let me change it to uh vb is now four meters per second minus negative six meters per second and in this case you're going to get negative 10 meters per second so that's that's sort of how that equation that we were able to derive uh sets it up it's the difference in the equations just flips negative signs before and after the collision so that's a, a way you can see how to use nine eight uh specifically for a case where the the ball was initially sitting still now we're going to try another example. So let's try another example where the two balls are, in fact, having different masses. And the initial uh, ball will actually be moving. And I think we can imagine it as if the second ball is not moving. Let me double check that. I want to try to sort of 
do this like the example in the book. So let me flip over to the book real quick and just make sure this is what I was remembering uh, from what I did earlier. So just to, to verify that I'm doing something very similar to what the textbook did, uh, just because that, that's actually a pretty good exhaustive uh, set for you to figure out stuff. So I'm going to open up my e-text. I'm going to open up my e-text again because you got to hit 15 tabs to do it. And then I'm going to go to chapter nine, which I'm currently in chapter 26 because that was the last class I finished. So let's go to chapter nine. And collisions in one dimension. So in this case, we just did the equal masses. Now we're doing the unequal target mass at rest. That's what it was. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to double check. So what we're going to have here is a mass MA moving with velocity VA and a mass MB sitting still. And then after the collision, what we're going to have is A moving with velocity VA prime and B moving with velocity VB prime. Okay. Now, if, if VA prime is really moving to the left, I'm going to be treating the right as if it's a positive direction. So that would come out as a negative and the VB would come out as a positive, just so you'll know. And we're going to treat this as a uh, one-dimensional, 1D-dimensional. Whoa, Nelly. Clearly, um, ooh, clearly, I can't get my eraser to work all those times that the eraser works when I don't want it now I can't get it flash head on elastic collision I want to find uh VA prime is question mark, VB prime is question mark, and I want to consider VA, or no, not VA, I want to consider MA much, much greater than MB, and I want to try also to consider MB much greater than ma okay so that's what i'm shooting for here i'm going to say solution and now i'm going to attempt to solve it so what we have by conservation of momentum is m a v a is equal to m a v a prime plus m b v b prime Okay, and what we also have is VA minus VB is equal to VB prime minus VA prime, only this is zero because it's, it's starting at rest. So this is going to be what I call equation one, and this is going to be what I call equation two. So uh, I can, for instance take this equation and solve for V A prime, and I'll get V A prime is equal to V B prime minus uh, V A. Okay, and that's gonna be what I call equation two prime. Now I'm going to plug two prime into one. What do I get when that happens? Well, I get M A V A is equal to M A times V B prime minus V A. 
plus MB times VB prime. Notice I'm assuming I know uh, MA, MB, and VA. So uh, the only thing I don't know is the VB prime and the VA prime. So now I can start distributing. I get MAVA is equal to MAVB prime. Sorry about that looking so messy. Actually, I can't let that stand. It's aggravating me. So MAVB prime minus MAVA plus MBVB prime. So you see we've got the VB prime, which is the unknown, is the only unknown in there. And in fact, I can go ahead and say, these are just commas, by the way. Now I can just say, okay, let's get everything on, uh, on the two sides. So if I pull the MAVA, to the left, I get 2MAVA is equal to, now you see that's taking care of this term and this term. Now what I'm going to do is take this term and this term, both of which have a VB, and I'm going to write it as M, oh, go back to black. I'm going to say MA plus MB times VB prime, which means I finally can solve for VB prime and I get VB prime is equal to 2MA over MA plus MB, all that times VA. Now, you might not remember this, and I wish I would have solved the other way around. If I would have solved this for VB prime and then plugged that in, I would have come up with the other expression. And the reason why I would like that is because that equation looks more familiar to you. This equation also looks familiar to me. It looks like the equation for tension in the Atwood machine. So C tension for Atwood machine. So that's a nice way for me to remember it. What I found is that the target particle will move off with basically a multiple of the initial velocity. And that uh, constant to make it a multiple is two times the mass of MA divided by the sum of the two masses. Now I can use two prime and let's call this, which would be three. I can use those two to solve for VA prime. So... Uh, use three and two prime to find the A prime. So all I have to do with that, actually, I hate again what I just did there. So, so all I have to do with that is I'm going to say V A prime is equal to VB prime, which we know is 2MA over MA plus MB times VA. And then subtracted from that is VA. So this thing just begs for a common denominator. So I'm going to say comma VA prime is equal to now I'm going to factor out the common factor of VA, uh, VA. So I'll just put that off to the side. And what I'm going to get here is 2 times MA, because it's already got the denominator MA plus MB. But now I've got to do minus. And I'm going to multiply by MA plus MB over MA plus MB. So this is going to be minus... And since it's a fraction, you can think about it as a fraction bar is the same as parentheses in terms of grouping. So you can put an MA plus MB there, and that'll be all over MA plus MB. Okay. So when we do this, we get VA times 2MA. Make sure I didn't make any mistakes. No, that all looks good. So times 2MA 
minus MA minus MB, all that divided by MA plus MB, like that. So I think you can see that now what's going to happen is this is going to cancel out with this and just leave an MA minus MB. And that's the part where I was telling you how it would look like the Atwood machine. So what I ultimately get is that VA prime is equal to MA minus MB over MA plus MB all that times VA, and that's the expression that I said looks just like the acceleration of the Atwood machine. So this is equation four, and as I said, C acceleration for Atwood. So the acceleration for Atwood was M minus M over M plus M times G. And you can see that looks just like this. And the tension, slightly different. The tension was M, or excuse me, was 2M over M plus M times MG. But again, you see that same two times the mass up there at the top. And actually, let me clean that up a little bit. That doesn't look so nice to me. So two times little m, like that, over m plus m times big mg. So you can see how uh, these two look like that. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, well, your book then goes on and does a nuclear collision, which I think you can look at. It's a pretty straightforward example. Uh, it also hints to you that you can uh, solve the same sort of problem we did without the target particle being at rest. Uh, and they give you the actual results in the uh, middle or just before the last problem of section 9.5. They give you results that'll be handy. Uh, what I'm going to do is look at a perfectly inelastic collision. So this is called a inelastic or perfectly inelastic collision. So and that means they stick together. which is basically basically what the bullet and the block of wood did in the uh, muzzle velocity problem. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine a train car. And let's say its mass, M, is equal to 15,000 kilograms. And let's say it's moving at uh, 20.0 meters per second. And I'm going to put a dot here just to suggest that that's a full five sig figs. Okay. And it's going to collide with a identical train car that's sitting still. So this one also is equal to 15,000 kilograms, but it's sitting still. So after the collision, what happens is we've got this train car locked up with this train car And they're both moving with a velocity V final and the total mass equals 30,000 kilograms. And we want to know what is V final. So this is an inelastic collision. So that means you definitely cannot use uh, conservation of kinetic energy.
Okay. So what we do have is uh, 15 zero, zero, zero point kilograms times 20.0 meters per second. That's the total momentum before the collision is equal to the total uh, co momentum after the collision, which is 30 thousand kilograms times V final. Okay. So if we multiply this, this is 15 times 10 to the third or 1.4 times 10 to 1.5 times 10 to the fourth. Uh, I'm going to make it 10 to the fifth and then do 3.0. That should be that. I'll double check just in case I made a mistake on my math. That gives me, yes, 300,000, which would be three times 10 to the fifth. And technically, I should have some more sig figs, but let me write out the exact number of sig figs just to keep it honest. So the exact number of sig figs here would be 3.0 zero and then that one's not a sig fig so 3.000 times 10 to the fifth that's going to be equal to 3.0000 times 10 to the fourth kilograms because remember i put that decimal there so that means all those sig figs are or are, are all those digits are sig figs so i can solve for this v final by dividing three times 10 to the fifth by 30,000. And that gives me, in fact, 10.0 meters per second. And that hopefully is somewhat expected because basically you took the momentum that a 15,000 kilogram train car had at 20 meters per second and now you're spreading that amongst two train cars of the same weight. So the momentum uh, went up according to the mass part of it. The mass part of it went up by a factor of two. And for M times V to stay the same, then V must go down by a factor of two. And that's why we got 20 uh, meters per second becoming 10 meters per second. Any questions on that? All right, so uh, that's just another type of collision. Uh, I will tell you, and I think I've actually taken the time to already put this up, but let me check real quick. Uh, one thing, for instance, I did is I shared a video in one of your modules. I can't remember if it's this week, last week, or what. Let's look at the modules right now. I'm looking at not any of those. Oh, I lost my modules. Okay, well, there's going to be a video. Uh, there are two videos that I put up, and you can actually find them on my YouTube channel already. But basically, there's a video where uh, we have a train car sitting on a train track. So let's let's draw a diagram. So let's imagine, for instance, a train car like this. And this is a magical train car <laughs> because it has a magical cannon on it. And it also has a magical stack of cannonballs on it as well. And let's say each of these has a mass M. And then M is the mass of the car, the cannon, Uh, the balls, well, not the balls. Yeah, I'll say the, the car and the cannon is enough. And what's going to happen is you're going to fire a cannonball. It's going to be moving with some velocity right there. And then it's going to hit the wall and fall straight down. And in fact, there's a wall to keep it where, in fact, after all of the balls are shot, they'll be stacked up right here. 
And this is all sitting on a railroad track, which obviously would have some friction, but those friction forces should be pretty small. Well, this thing's going to recoil just like the rifle recoiled when we fired. So when you fire this cannon, uh, the instant the cannon leaves the, or the instant the explosion occurs that pushes the cannon relative to the can, uh, the cannonball relative to the cannon, what's going to happen is the train plus cannonballs plus cannon plus little wall is all going to move to the left with some velocity. Okay, that's the recoil velocity. Then it's going to continue moving to the left until the cannonball hits the right wall, at which time the cannonball delivers exactly the same momentum that uh, the recoiling train car had. So then the recoiling train car will come to a stop. And then you can load up another cannonball, do it again. Again, it's going to recoil, moving with the same momentum that the cannonball had, but in the opposite direction. You got to even account for that because with the train car moving to the left and the cannonball moving to the right, the velocity relative to the train car is what's relevant because you need to know how how long the cannonball is going to be in the air before it actually hits the other wall because that's the only time that the train car gets to travel from right to left. So you keep track of all of that. And when you're finished firing all the cannonballs, what's it happened is the recoil velocity that the train car had multiplied by the time that the cannonball was in the air is going to give you the distance the train car pulled to the left after one cannonball. And then you do it again after another and then another and another and do it for, you know, five, 10, 20 cannonballs, whatever, doesn't matter. The main thing is when this is all said and done, you're now going to have the train car is moved some distance right here, say. Oops, that went bad really quickly. I was trying to keep track of my blocks and stuff. And what's going to happen is the train car will have moved some distance. And of course, all the train, uh, all the cannonballs will be stacked up here now, like that. The wall's still going to be there. The cannon is still going to be there, right? But this thing has moved a distance delta x, which equals uh, v recoil relative to the thing times uh, t1 plus t2 plus t three plus dot, dot, dot for T N, where N is the number of cannonballs. And you can actually determine how far away it's moved. That's pretty interesting. And it's it's not a, not a I mean, it's sort of easy in that conservation of momentum is a really easy equation, uh, but it's a little bit time consuming because you got to really, not only can you figure out how fast the uh, cannonball is going to fire out of the cannon, You've got to figure out how fast that is relative to the recoiling train car. And that, of course, requires a little bit of an addition of velocities. That gives you a new velocity. Then you're going to multiply that by the amount of time it has in going from the cannon to the other end of the wall. And then you're going to add that up over and over and over again. And lo and behold, you'll get a delta X. So that's kind of neat. And, and that's a, a neat little problem to solve. But it turns out you can solve the problem again. This method, method was all with conservation of momentum. But it turns out you can also do it with, concert, uh, with uh, center of mass. So we treat, treated the system as if it was the train car, the cannon, the wall, and all the cannonballs. And uh, the net force on the system was zero, so momentum had to be conserved. And we ended up being able to figure out how far to the left the actual uh, train car had moved at the end of firing, let's say, N balls. So N is the number of balls okay but in the center of mass system 
we're realizing that the system again is the train car, the cannonballs, the cannon, the wall, and all that stuff. So the net force on the system is zero. Again, yeah, the cannonballs are going to put forces on, well, the explosion is going to put forces on the cannon, which puts forces on the train car. And then the cannonball is going to hit the far wall, and that's going to put another force on the on the uh, train car. But those are all internal forces. So according to Newton's second law of motion, if the net force acting on the system is zero, then the center of mass can't move. And that's what we're going to learn next time is how to calculate center of mass. But what's going to happen in this case is you're going to calculate the center of mass of the train car. And oops, I went a little far there. And the center of mass of the train car, uh, just, you know, from working it out is roughly going to be right here. Okay. And the center of mass of the system cannot move. If the summation of forces equals zero. Now, in principle, if it was moving, it could continue to move at a constant speed because that's really what Newton's second law is about. But in this case, it's not moving, so uh, it can't move uh, in general. So what's going to happen is when you move all these cannonballs, which are initially here, 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 to move them all to over here, where you get them here, 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 what's going to happen is the center of mass of the system is no longer, so let's say, dead center between it. What's going to happen is now the center of mass of the system is going to be moved a little bit over this way. So now this center of mass is over here, and lo and behold, the distance here, delta x, from where the original, oh, actually, I should say a different way. Hold on, let's get rid of all that. So I'm going to get rid of that one, too. So what we can say now is this change right here is delta x, which is the same as delta x above. So it's kind of interesting and it's a neat philosophical argument to say that basically a problem that you solve with conservation of momentum, you can also solve with the center of mass. And this is the case in point. So I will make sure both of those videos are posted on your modules and you'll see me solving it with conservation of momentum. Then you'll see me solving it with the center of mass. And then next time, when we meet, I will not only solve some problems where you're doing conservation of momentum and collisions in two dimensions, but I'm also going to show you how to calculate the center of mass of a system uh, using integrals. So I would highly recommend that you read uh, the section. Uh, technically, let me look what section that is since I have the e-text over here. Uh, I would say you should make sure you read sections 9, 7, uh, through 9, 9. So read sections 9, 7 through 9, 9 for next time. And you should be a little bit more prepared than you maybe feel like you normally are. Uh, and that'll help you. So we are essentially done. Uh, I'm letting you out about six minutes early and, and that's fine. So next time when I see you, I will be covering sections 9, 7, 9, 8, and 9, 9. Uh, feel free to stick around and ask me questions, and you're free to go other than that. I still got a question about that. Uh, you sent the wrong test. Oh, did yeah. I? Okay. You yeah, said it was a, a lockdown browser. I think you sent me the online test.
Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to stop sharing this right quick. And now I am going to pause the recording.